Hello and welcome to MOS at Home. My name is Megan and my pronouns are she and her. And my name is Meg and my pronouns are she and her. And brr, it's cold outside. It is, but I love this time of year, the crispy cold air and the snow. And you know what else? Quantum physics. Yes, quantum. Wait, what? What does quantum physics have to do with winter? Um, everything. Quantum physics is the science that describes how the tiniest building blocks in our universe work. Things like atoms and subatomic particles. And these teeny tiny atoms and particles make up everything in our universe, including snowflakes and hats and even light. Light is made of particles. And because quantum physics describes how atoms and particles work and everything is made of atoms and particles, that means it has something to do with everything, even the winter season. Oh, wow, you're right. Well, how about we show our audience some fun examples? Yes, I'll go first. Great, I'll see you in a bit. Why don't we start with snowflakes? <laughs> They're gorgeous, symmetrical, famously unique, and they owe their iconic shape to quantum physics. In fact, the molecular structure of water ice was an early triumph of quantum mechanics when Linus Pauling used the theory in 1935 to accurately predict how the hydrogen atoms in the water molecules arrange themselves when ice forms. Snowflakes have a characteristic six-fold symmetry because water, H2O, is a polar molecule. No, I'm not talking about the North Pole. That just means that the positive and negative charges within each water molecule are not perfectly symmetric. The positive hydrogens are kind of on one side of the molecule and the negative oxygen is on the other. Because of that very small charge difference, the two ends of the different H2O molecules are attracted and repelled from each other, pushing and pulling them into an arrangement that makes everyone happy. As water freezes, this arrangement becomes sort of like a three-sided pyramid structure, where each oxygen atom has four other oxygen neighbors, and the hydrogen atoms can be oriented in a few different ways, as long as they're pointed to two other nearby oxygen atoms. Pauling used quantum mechanics to calculate the residual entropy of ice, basically counting up all the possible orientations the hydrogen atoms could have to give an estimate of the randomness or disorder in the crystal structure. When he compared his calculation to observations, they matched. Now, snowflakes are always six-sided because that's what quantum mechanics tells us about how H2O molecules arrange themselves, but they can actually come in a whole range of variations, depending on the temperature and the humidity. When the air is drier, you tend to get hexagonal plates or even solid prisms, and the beautiful star-shaped snowflakes tend to form when it's a bit more humid out. So the next time you're out in the snow, take a closer look at what's falling from the sky. You might be surprised. Wow, thanks, Meg. I love the snow. I'm one of those people who's always wondering if it's going to be a snowy winter and checking the weather to see if it's going to snow. But as we all know, the weather forecast is not always all that accurate. Forecasting the weather requires the analysis of huge amounts of really complicated data that are constantly being generated. It's a really tricky task. But one day, we could get some help from quantum physics through something called a quantum computer. A quantum computer is a new type of computer that's being developed by scientists all over the world. The way these new computers work is very different from the way our current computers work because quantum computers harness special behaviors of atoms and subatomic particles to process enormous amounts of information simultaneously. In theory, a really complex problem that could take our computers today years and years to solve could be solved in no time on a quantum computer. In fact, last year, Google announced that they had built a quantum computer that was way faster than even the most powerful supercomputer that exists today. But just recently, scientists in China announced that they have one that's even faster. They say it could complete a calculation in just three and a half minutes that it would take two and a half billion years to solve on our existing computers. One thing scientists think quantum computers will be really good at is analyzing huge amounts of complicated data, which is good for a lot of things, including trying to predict the weather or how our climate is changing. 
But beyond just helping us figure out how the climate is changing, quantum computers may be able to help us figure out how to minimize the effects of climate change. Another thing quantum computers could be really good at is figuring out how molecules, atoms, and tiny quantum particles behave which could help us figure out how to make more energy efficient technologies and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Quantum computers are still very new. They can't quite tackle these problems just yet, but scientists are making new advances all the time. And maybe one day soon, quantum physics will be able to tell you if it's going to snow. Cold temperatures definitely have a big impact on nature. Take trees, for example. Even though many kinds of trees lose their leaves in winter, some are evergreen, hanging on to those needles to put them back to work in warmer times. But evergreen trees, and all plants actually, may share a quantum secret to their success. Plants need sunlight for photosynthesis, which is a surprisingly efficient process for gathering energy. When photons, little packets of light, hit spruce needles, for example, they're first absorbed by a special molecule called an antenna. And the energy carried by the photons has to get from the antenna to a reaction center where that energy can actually be put to use. To get from one to the other, special proteins called light harvesting complexes work with light absorbing pigment molecules like chlorophyll to collect energized electrons from the antenna and bring them to the reaction center. Here's the thing, there are lots and lots of different paths that this energy could take to bounce between all of the sites within a light harvesting complex. So which one is the fastest way to get there? Researchers have evidence that photosynthesis might actually take advantage of a quantum trick called coherence that allows that energy to take lots of different paths at the same time. Sort of like that quantum computing you were just hearing about contributing to the awesomely efficient ability plants have to survive just on sunlight and water. The winter brings about changes in animals too. For example, a lot of birds will migrate to places that are warmer or have more food during the winter. But how do birds know which way to go without a map? Scientists know that bird navigation relies, at least in part, on their ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field. But exactly how they do this has kept scientists guessing. But not too long ago, scientists discovered that it might come down to a weird phenomenon of quantum physics called entanglement. That happens inside a type of light detecting protein called a cryptochrome found in the bird's eye. Scientists think that certain types of cryptochromes can undergo chemical reactions that could make them sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. When the cryptochrome is activated by light, a chemical reaction happens that results in pairs of electrons that have special quantum properties. First, they have a property called spin that can be pointed up or down, but spin can also be up or down at the same time. And these pairs of electrons are also linked or entangled, meaning they have a special connection to each other. And these weird quantum states of the electrons can be affected by the Earth's magnetic field. And some scientists think that this results in a quantum compass that birds can actually see, perhaps like this in shades of gray that tell the bird which direction it's headed. So it can find its way to its winter hangout. Well, it's not just birds that travel in the winter. People do a lot of traveling too. Well, maybe not this year, but usually. And winter travel is not always fast or easy. Travel hubs are crowded with people going on vacation and snow and ice can get in the way. But what if you could get from New York to Los Angeles in just seven hours without getting on a plane or dealing with airports? Well, you could if you took something called a superconducting maglev or magnetic levitation train. These trains aren't a reality in the US yet, but some countries like Japan are already using them. And the secret to these levitating trains well, you guessed it, quantum physics, a special phenomenon called superconductivity. Now to understand superconductors, we need to take a look at what's happening when electricity flows. So if we try zooming in on a typical copper wire that we use to plug things in, and we zoom in all the way down to the individual atoms that make up the copper wire, you see these electrons, those little white particles, well, they can move through the wire. And this flow of electrons is what we call electricity. But the flow isn't perfect. 
some of the electrons will like bump into other atoms, which causes them to lose energy. And that's what we call resistance. It means that there's energy being wasted as heat. But some materials under very special conditions can become what's called a superconductor, where the electrons flow perfectly with no resistance. The electrons all act like a team or a collective and flow right through the material perfectly. The thing is, superconductors don't work unless they are really, really cold. The superconducting magnets in a maglev train have to be kept at around negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit. But when superconductors are kept cold and you pair them with some really strong magnets, they repel the magnetic field and that can make things levitate. And it's super fun. Here's an example of a superconductor that we have at the Museum of Science. It has this disc that contains the superconducting material that's been cooled in liquid nitrogen. And when you place it over some strong magnets, it floats. There's absolutely nothing holding it up except the laws of quantum physics. Now, superconducting maglev trains work differently than the superconductor in that demo, but the basic idea is the same. When you pair superconductors with really strong magnets, really cool things happen. But they're not just good for trains. Superconductors could one day be used to help us create energy efficient technologies, if we can get them to work at room temperature. Scientists are getting warmer in the search for higher temperature superconductors, but for now, they're still out in the cold. While the cold may make us want to curl up inside by a cozy fire, it can actually be a quantum physicist's best friend, and superconductors are just the tip of the iceberg. Studying teeny tiny atoms and particles is really hard. First of all, they're incredibly small. For example, you could fit about a trillion atoms on the head of a pin. But also, all these atoms and particles, they're always moving around fast. So physicists cool them down to ultra cold temperatures, which slows the atoms down, so they're easier to examine. How cold? Well, close to something called absolute zero, about negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. At these amazingly cold temperatures, atoms move so slowly that they're barely moving at all, making it a lot easier for scientists to study things that happen on the quantum scale. Plus, scientists are discovering that lots of other cool properties in addition to superconductivity can emerge at these very cold temperatures. In fact, in an effort to get things as cold as possible, scientists are now studying quantum physics on the International Space Station in something that's called the Cold Atom Lab, which is on its way to becoming the coldest place in the known universe. Burr. Okay, let's take a break from the cold and warm up. One thing I love when it's super cold out is cocoa. Just thinking about the smell of hot chocolate makes me feel all warm and toasty. And it turns out those yummy winter smells have a quantum connection too. Our sense of smell depends on olfactory receptors, about 400 different kinds of special proteins in your nose that react to different scent molecules and signal your brain that you're sensing a particular smell. Traditionally, this reaction has been thought to be all about a scent molecule's shape. But some recent studies suggest something a little different. Molecules are made up of different atoms, and each atom has a little bit of kinetic energy. This molecule of carbon dioxide, for example, is made of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, arranged in a line like this and connected by chemical bonds. These atoms are basically bumping around inside the molecule, pushing and pulling each other a little bit. But this jostling doesn't happen just any old which way. Because of the specific types of atoms and their arrangement, molecules end up vibrating in very specific ways. In fact, these vibrations are so specific to different molecules and energy levels that scientists use them to identify different materials in the lab and even in space. The thing is that molecules can only have specific amounts of energy. And if that sounds a little quantum-ish to you, you are correct. At a higher energy state, a molecule will vibrate differently than one at a lower energy state. Our carbon dioxide molecule can do this, for example, or at a higher energy level, it can do this, and even higher, it can do this. Scent molecules can have lots of atoms, giving them their own specific vibrations. 
The vibration theory of smell proposes that our olfactory receptors are not just sensitive to a scent molecule's shape, but that the two actually trade a little bit of energy, just the right quantized amount, to allow an electron in the receptor to drop down to a lower energy state, triggering the signal to the brain that your cookies just might be out of the oven. Hmm. Another thing that makes this one of the most magical times of the year is the December solstice, which happens to be the beginning of winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. The winter solstice is the point in Earth's orbit where we experience the longest night of the year, and the amount of daylight we get is at a minimum. Even on the shortest day of the year, though, we can still thank quantum mechanics for that sunshine. And that's because the process fueling the sun, the fusion of hydrogen atoms, depends on quantum mechanics. Consider for a moment two hydrogen atoms. Each one has a positively charged proton in the nucleus. And if we were to bring them closer together, they would repel each other. This electric repulsion is a huge obstacle to fusion. And even in the sun's core, where temperatures and pressures are astronomical, it seems that that shouldn't happen. So why does it? Well, you may have heard of a key idea in quantum physics, wave particle duality. These protons are actually quantum particles. Their position at any given time is not exact. There's only a probability that it's a little bit over here or a little bit over there. They're actually wave-like. And since these probabilities can overlap ever so slightly, every once in a while, two protons can end up in the same place at the same time, overcoming that electric propulsion and fusing together. This is called quantum tunneling, and even though it's super rare, the core has enough hydrogen atoms bumping around each other that it happens often enough to power the sun. And now that we're past winter solstice, which was on December 21st, we're getting more and more time each day to enjoy those quantum generated rays. Now let's check in with Megan and see how she's doing. Hi Megan, and thanks for trading quantum stories with me. Thanks Meg. And thank you for joining us. This has been so much fun and I hope you're staying warm. Yeah, we have a ton of great stuff going on over at MOS at Home. So follow us on social media or check out our website at www.mos.org slash MOS at Home. If you enjoyed this program, please consider supporting the Museum of Science by visiting us at engage.mos.org slash welcome. Your support will help us provide science experiences online and help us ensure that this content can be accessed from home at no cost. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Stay warm. Bye.